Welcome to the California Emerging Technology Fund, inaugural conversation on the quest for digital equity. Today, we have two trailblazing members of the Federal Communications Commission as our first guests. So welcome, Rochelle Chong and Mignon Clyburn. Good morning. The Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, is comprised of five members. By law, two of those five members must be from the opposite party of the president. Rochelle Chong was appointed by Bill Clinton in 1994 as a Republican member of the Federal Communications Commission. She is from Stockton, California. Rochelle and I are both uh, Valley girls from the great San Joaquin Valley of California, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate from UC Berkeley, an attorney. She became the first Asian American to serve on the FCC. She later was appointed to the California Public Utilities Commission in 2005, Mignon Clyburn was appointed to the FCC in 2009 by President Obama. Previously, she had served for 11 years on the South Carolina Public Com uh, Services Commission. And prior to that, Mignon was a very successful businesswoman running her family owned newspaper in historical Charleston. So Rochelle Chong, uh, we want to sort of pull back the veil of the beltway and what goes on in DC and understand, so why did President Clinton uh, recognize your talents and brilliance and appoint you? I think that I was the compromise candidate. This one really is the bottom line. So they were calling around and here was the criteria. This is the best part. They wanted a quote, real Republican, preferably a lawyer, preferably a woman, preferably a minority, and uh, he or she had to know what the internet was, which at that time we charmingly called it the information superhighway. Yep. So um, they did outreach and Ginger Lou was the transition team member on the Clinton team. She went to small business later as a, as a deputy secretary. She reached out to the Asian Bar Association in the Bay Area and they went through their directory and in the back under communications, there was only one person, so it was me. So I got my name, at least in the mix, and then um, I was very ballsy. I was coming back from a conference in Florida, and I thought, I'll just go by D.C. and go see Senator Dole's office. So I went in there without a meeting, and it just so happened his chief of staff was standing at the reception desk. And he, I said to them, I'm Rochelle Chong. I'm being considered for the FCC. And he looks at me like, what? But he brought me in and asked me a bunch of hard questions about fairness doctrine and things like that. And I must have done okay because he, he uh, about a week later, I got a call from the uh, transition team and they said, we don't know why, but you're at the top of Senator Dole's list. So you can come out and interview with us and meet the vice president. So that's how it happened. So you met Al Gore if you went out to talk to the vice president uh, who talked about the information superhighway. Uh, a good lesson learned from that is put yourself forward. Uh, even if you've got immense qualifications, somebody has to be your champion and it has to begin with you. And so uh, that's a great story. Um, Mignon, I knew about you because as a commissioner in South Carolina, you were involved with our commissioners from California. And then uh, you were appointed by President Obama. And um, I'm just interested in how that all came together and how the conversation went down. My journey was um, interesting. Uh, back in, uh, I think it was 2002 or so, um, there was an open seat on the FCC. Someone uh, mentioned my name because at the time, if we, if we all you know, go back, uh, there was a sort of a understood designated seat for a state commissioner. So if you were a state commissioner um, and had good relationships, you had a, an advantage. I went up and, and spoke to uh, you know, the, uh, one very prominent um, uh, senator. I could tell at the time that um, you know, I was just, it was just a courtesy meeting. So I went back home, got the confirmation that you know, now is not your time. Fast forward to the political dynamics um, of the uh, Obama administration and the significance of South Carolina, what role it played uh, uh, to propel him uh, to the White House. 
the fact of the matter is these are political jobs. Uh, and uh, the relationships you have with politicians, they absolutely matter. Uh, I wish I could say to you that um, your ability, your know-how and the rest of that was first. It is not first. It is definitely second, third, or fourth, you know, depending on the dynamic. So I, I always say to people that if you want consideration uh, in, in Washington, D.C., or in the state houses or in these boards and commissions, um, you know, you have to uh, be known and connected. And yes, um, you should know uh, what you're seeking. Um, but number one, it's the political connections. Um, I, I have one or two, as you, as you may know, and all of those dynamics definitely helped in the process. But I will say, this was my second go round. Thank you so much, uh, Mignon. And I might say that you, as the acting chair of the Federal Communications Commission in 2013, will always be for the California Emerging Technology Fund, our chair, who Thank put you. forward as a top priority getting all Americans connected, particularly low income households. So you're always our star. And uh, let's just for uh, everybody in our audience, underscore the role of South Carolina, uh, not only uh, historically, but this year. And uh, Mignon referenced uh, one or two connections. Uh, her family, his historical in uh, South Carolina, in Charleston. Her father is Jim Clyburn, who serves in Congress and uh, was quite instrumental as the primaries unfolded. As all of our work has unfolded for 14 years, we have come to understand that there is an imperative for digital equity. In fact, we call digital equity a 21st century civil right. So we are uh, very, very focused on accomplishing not just the deployment of infrastructure, but getting all Californians online. So I want to really start with the conversation around what does digital equity mean to you? It is a quest. Um, it is a, a, a very precise and intentional way of narrowing divides when it comes to 21st century tools and opportunities. Uh, so not so very long ago, uh, this was not a priority for many, uh, but th this pandemic um, has exposed a, a lot of our faults and weaknesses. And one that is glaring is that the primary tool for addressing uh, what the major challenges are in front of us, be it continual education, uh, healthcare opportunities without uh, risking um, your exposure or anybody else's exposure to you uh, in person. What we also know is not all households or individuals are created equal. So when we talk about equity, that is a, a, a word in terms of its application uh, that is different for every household, is different for every uh, individual. Uh, the establishment of your entity was critical in recognizing that there has to be a public private role uh, for all of us to play in order to address uh, those inequities. Uh, so um, I, I really think when you talk about the quest for digital equity, those are four important words because if we continue on that journey of, of, of conquering uh, those inequities, there are a lot of other things that will be better controlled, better managed, uh, and we would have a more, not only a more connected future, but more prosperous future. I've had the pleasure of starting this issue, I think really early. I joined the commission in 94. And at that time, really, the information superhighway concept was more about let's get libraries to developing countries, let's get access to telehealth to rural remote areas, probably one of the most important I ever made in my life, to not regulate them like a telephone system, but to leave them as an information service. Now, fast forward, when I got to the PC, then there was more, much more internet, but it was clearly like a luxury service similar to what Mignon said. And it drove me crazy because I, it really pointed out that the 
people who were building the internet thought that it was okay that disenfranchised, disadvantaged communities got worse service, frankly. And I always was outraged by that and thought that was just wrong. So now fast forward, it turns out we were all right all along because the pandemic hits, everybody needs internet. What this means is we need some really different thinking in Washington about A, funding for infrastructure, and B, the way that we run our universal service funding program. It's uh, so outdated, it's ridiculous. Honestly, the way to fix it is a federal legislative change. So I think the main battlefield for digital equity right now is in Washington. I, I, Sonny, I couldn't uh, agree more. Um, and unfortunately, uh, people have a tendency to take the political posturing and um, use a sor certain buzzwords like not taxing the internet and, and the like. Uh, the common denominator uh, is the internet. That's the base, but it fuels uh, and um, you know that germinates and that helps to uh, cultivate and expand all of the other lines of interest and efforts and opportunities. But until we put politics at the um, you know, front door and say, this is an unsustainable way that we are funding currently, this is not a right way to administer uh, these programs. Until that happens, um, honestly, uh, you know, this is a collision uh, waiting to happen. And um, uh, you know, we can continue to punt, uh, but uh, not so very, in the not so distant future, um, you know, we're going to pay a heavy price if we're not proactive. We are very focused on being proactive. Uh, we literally quote in our latest progress report, it's time for good trouble uh, in our quest for digital equity. And we state explicitly that the digital divide is just another manifestation of the economic divide. Um, that is rooted in systemic institutionalized racism. And if we do not understand that there is a whole set of interrelated factors that prevent low income households from getting online, we call it the wall of poverty, that there has to be not only intervention with infrastructure, but also services, policy, uh, extraordinary efforts uh, working with the residents in low income and digitally disadvantaged communities. What are those barriers to closing the digital divide? Mignon. Uh, the, the barriers are um, our politics. The barriers are sometimes a very myopic uh, point of view from the regulator. Um, you know, from uh, those legislators that see the world through their lens, um, but often fail to see the world through the lens of, um, of those um, who live a, f a few hundred miles away. And Rochelle Chong, you are the mother of the California Advanced Services Fund in California. You came up with this really brilliant insight of how to take what was a telephony subsidy fund and devote it to the internet. It is the primary tool that we have in the state to support deployment into communities where the marketplace hasn't operated. And what are the congressional changes in law that would empower the FCC to be able to do what we all have just said needs to be done? <clears throat> well, I'm glad you mentioned the CASF because what I saw happening when I was a PUC commissioner was market failure. And I'm pleased to say that my understanding is we do have a number of California ISPs that have applied into the RDOF um, auctions going on right now as we speak. And I'm excited about it because I do think that we have an opportunity to fill some spots in California that haven't gotten funds yet. But um, there is a possibility that the PUC, they have a rulemaking out that will allow some of the CASF funds to be used as a 10% match for RDOF. So what does that mean pragmatically? It means that the bidders can stay in longer and bid longer because they know they've got another 10% in CASF funds. Number two, it means that they can um, take some costs that aren't covered by RDOF and apply the CASF funds. Uh, similar to what we did back in the ARA days where CASF was used as a um, additional 
uh, pot of money. For the you know, one of the things I remember uh, a few years ago, I had a wonderful uh, visit at, I believe it was a middle school uh, in uh, Los Angeles. I, I remember being visiting uh, our friends at Annenberg and not really going that far away. Um, but it was like light years away because that beautiful, very uh, mature, meaning on the older end and by way of infrastructure schools, had many, as many negative uh, challenges when it comes, when it came to connecting it as some of our rural communities, meaning that old building could not hold support and withstand uh, some of the critical infrastructure needed to connect those children. I say that to say this, now I'm from a rural state, so I, I am not throwing anyone under the bus. The digital divide is as much an urban problem it is as it is a rural problem. And if we simply have a one-dimensional uh, uh, attack or address to this issue, um, you know, pretending that is just a rural problem, we will not truly connect America. Now, one of the things that um, John Salad um, and I talked about, John Salad is a senior fellow at Benton. Uh, we penned an op-ed and we talked about uh, and challenged Congress to establish a permanent, a permanent broadband uh, uh, credit uh, that would be fifty dollars a month more in on on Native nations uh, to for those uh, to address the affordability gap. Uh, that the current programs are not doing. We have a lifeline program that um, honestly is on life support, but this type of program will at least in, in the cities, um, I think the average monthly broadband cost might be about $60. At least this will do something like this would really make a substantial difference closing the affordability uh, gap here. Digital equity uh, programs need to be expanded uh, and endorsed and supported uh, by my members of Congress. These money should go to the community colleges, other anchored institutions, not profits. Uh, again, Alaska Native, tribal, uh, Native Hawaiian uh, lands, and, and yes, uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and, and, and the like. Uh, uh, because that is needed. Those types of wraparound partnerships uh, are, are, are needed digital skills enhancements. We need to be, I think all of this should be a part of an infrastructure bill that we've been waiting for for like four plus years, to be honest with you, what happened to infrastructure that was supposed to be done um, you know, years ago. Um, all of this needs to be uh, wrapped into an infrastructure bill because quite frankly, uh, uh, it is availability. We do have redlining when it comes to uh, the infrastructure bill. We do have gaps in the intercities, in, um, uh, in suburban communities, and of course in rural communities that needs, they, those needs should be addressed. So, um, you know, Congress uh, as the appropriator uh, could direct funding but those of us at the state and local level need to partner to ensure that uh, the, uh, the resources flow to where it's needed the most. So uh, Mignon, it does require congressional action to give to the FCC the authority you're talking about. Is that, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. Yes, the, the most efficient way I believe if, if we were to set up a permanent uh, broadband credit, I believe the most efficient uh, uh, agency to do it uh, with USAC's help would be the FCC. I, I really do in terms of uh, administering. Uh, then we have to get to the politics and the, and the rest of it. So we need to look at existing institutions and say, how do we best execute uh, what we know right now uh, are, are the issues and challenges we have and make the regulatory changes, make the legislative changes needed in order to uh, uh, connect our communities. We can allocate, continue to allocate these billions of dollars that are going to flow in our communities, but if we do not ensure that they are allocated and spent effectively in a sustainable manner to ways and places supporting and enabling 
new and existing players to be a part of the solution, we're going to have the same conversation in three to five years. Uh, we would have spent billions of dollars and have the same uh, proportion of, of di uh, those on the wrong side of the digital divide if we do not recalibrate our way of thinking. Uh, CETF received two grants from the from NTIA for the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And as a result of that, we were invited to submit testimony to a Senate subcommittee in 2013. And one of our recommendations was you have to, as Congress, declare that it is the policy of the nation to get everybody connected and to cross cut um, the policies from one silo to another, from all departments uh, needing to have a common purpose, that it be infused into the Health and Human Services Agency, into uh, housing and urban development, into the Department of Transportation, into EPA, with a place to administer the subsidies for both the infrastructure deployment and the adoption of the technology. And we focus on the FCC as that institution to be able to do that. What do you think the FCC needs to do to get a truly effective lifeline program for the internet um, back up and, and, and operating? institute those reforms that would uh, allow the program to mature um, like the other USF programs have matured. Uh, it would uh, allow for it to attract uh, innovative providers. Uh, there were providers that were teed up uh, to directly focus on healthcare needs, directly focus on those uh, students that did not have a uh, broadband connectivity at home. There were providers that had innovative products and services that if they were uh, allowed at that point in time to advance their business plans with broken down silos so they didn't have to go state by state by state, which is an expensive and long and exhaustive process. But the politics and the posturing is really stopping us from advancing to the next level. And it really cost us a lot of valuable time pre-COVID. And I, honestly, if there's anything that haunts me in this process, it is that we could have done a lot of fixing uh, before this pandemic. And my friends, and some of them are my friends who kept saying, don't worry about it, they can go to the library. Newsflash, the library is closed. They can barely, you know, students can barely go to school. Seniors can barely get to their uh, doctor's appointment. Those without cars uh, are too afraid to get on our metros and our buses. Look at what we could have done if we were to uh, allow that program and others that could have been complementary that we could have developed that uh, directly addressed the affordability gap, that directly uh, that addressed the availability gap when it when it comes to um, uh, connectivity, uh, when it comes to those on the cusp, because there are people that make one cent more than, than who would qualify for Lifeline that are struggling um, hard too in order to maintain a connection. So if I sound passionate about this, I am. If I sound just as appointed about the wasted time and opportunities, I am. But let's learn from that uh, and then let's move forward in a way that puts aside whatever your uh, notions about whatever you call Lifeline, a very politically incorrect way, and see if that program has a way, um, since it's already set up, to be a part of the solution when it comes to narrowing uh, or, or that quest, as you said, for digital equity. Well, you uh, uh, keep that passion. Uh, it is exactly what uh, the Honorable John Robert Lewis said about making good trouble. You remind me, you visited John Muir Middle School uh, with uh, our senior vice president, Susan Walters. Now that is a school in South Los Angeles in the heart of uh, a very low income community, a low performing school that we've turned around with our, our school to home program. And I mention that because every child 
has um, an ability to exceed uh, beyond where we have provided opportunities in these low income neighborhoods. The day before Chairman Ajit Pai, current uh, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai visited the San Fernando Institute of Applied Media. You're from two different parties, came back to the FCC and reported that you both supported uh, the kind of success that you were seeing with school to home. We need to overcome the politics and not allow any, any person, any party to have a veto on the future of this country or on the ability of any person to reach their full potential. I also note that you mentioned um, that John Sallet, you co-authored uh, an op-ed. Um, the Benton Institute for Broadband just released a report on um, broadband in the 2020s. Both you uh, and Rochelle are quoted. Rochelle, you are quoted about leadership. It is always around leadership that something happens. So please, um, in this passion that you share with uh, Mignon and uh, representing CETF that is always into what I think is good trouble and taking on the status quo, talk about the federal laws that you think need to be passed to empower the FCC to help us continue what we need to do in California that would make a huge difference to get everybody online. I think the first thing that I would say is we need to immediately move to get affordable broadband to people that can't afford it. Uh, as Mignon said, we have about 60 to $70 as the average retail rate. And right now in California, our Lifeline program is $9.25 from the feds and then $14.25 from California. And if you add that up, that's not enough to make broadband affordable. So um, what I would like to see done is there should be a mandatory lifeline offer by all ISPs, not just wireless ISPs, but also wireline. So that would be the telcos and the cable players. I think that would go a long way to make affordability um, happen. Um, and, and you can do it a number of ways. If they wanna take federal grants for infrastructure, then they should be required to have an affordable rate. And um, there's been an affordability rulemaking in California that has a formula that could set what affordability means depending on where you are. So it's doable. The second thing I would say is we have to solve this contribution issue that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is fraught with terrible politics. There's no question, but I, will, I am very encouraged. We have a working group now that includes all the players, including the very noisy player that claims it's a tax on the internet, and we are showing with data where this current system takes us and it takes us to nowhere. I think the final thing I would say is we have to figure out some way to get this out of the political arena. This is now broadband, a utility. Everybody has to have it. And that's what the pandemic showed us. Um, and I do wanna give um, my esteemed fellow commissioner a huge prop. She did something that I felt was really important when she was a commissioner and she reformed the prison payphone telephone system. And, and Rochelle, thank you for referencing uh, that accomplishment by Mignon. Uh, you have been representing uh, CETF before the California Public Utilities Commission on several proceedings. We are advocates for public-private partnership. We want to see sincere partnerships with the industry. We underscore the word sincere because we can't come up with a better word to say if we're both genuinely committed to digital equity, then it is in the public interest to have industry step up and do what they can do with innovation and do it efficiently and to work with government and nonprofits because we have to act together in the public interest. How do we craft this um, relationship of partnerships and nest it with Lifeline, what is the role of the ISP? I will tell you that now ISPC is coming and they know what they need to do. They have to make a public benefit commitment to an affordable broadband plan. And now late recently, some infrastructure commitments. But what, what I don't like about it is these things end. And in fact, most of them 
have some kind of affordable program, although it, it, they don't market it. It's hard to find. The data is not adequate in those plans. Um, so another big issue we've been bringing to the PUC is adequate data in these lifeline plans. Big fight at the federal level right now, big fight in California. We've been spending a lot of money going after the data piece. The other piece is people need family plans. And right now, Lifeline only um, funds one line to the house. So we've been working on making sure it could be a hotspot so that people could share it, uh, that it could be a tablet device so that people could share it, and those types of things. And in California, um, I will say, for the first time, the PUC has proposed a, quote, family line. So you could buy one line at a regular rate and then have the ability at a lifeline rate to buy a second line if you need it, which could be a Wi-Fi hotspot or a tablet so that other people in the family, such as children or a spouse, could, could do work at the same time. So I feel like we are making a lot of progress this particular year at the PUC. And we're trying to figure out how do we then take these reforms and move them up into the federal arena so that the FCC side has equal benefits. And we haven't played as much up at the FCC and Lifeline, but we are participating in this contribution ad hoc group to bring some of these ideas forward. And there's some good data that's coming out of this ad hoc group on contributions that I think we can bring back to California. So it's, it's a big area of focus right now with the pandemic and the digital equity affordability piece that um, my colleague has brought up so forcefully. And it has to be done really this year. This is our one chance to do these affordability issues right now. It is necessary for us when um, a, a regulator um, has a finite ability to do certain things, no matter how uh, passionate uh, she is. But entities like yours, other you know organizations, we need to be a better um, recipient of that baton that is passed from the regulatory um, you know, agency to plug in these holes and these gaps. So we have to be a community of a whole, pick up that baton and do something with it and challenge those. Um, even if we don't have quote unquote, the law behind us, we have the power of common sense and, and ensuring uh, that um, the companies who say they're partly here to serve, um, that they fully uh, take, uh, you know, take up the reins and, and show it uh, uh, by getting rid of rules that make absolutely no sense uh, when we are trying to connect America. You've always been good to listen to California, to come to California. Um, could you advise California or any other state? What do we do at this moment in time as, as, as a whole community that cares about digital equity to work at the federal level and specifically with the FCC? You continue to challenge the agency uh, to have nimble enough rules and regulations that will allow you the, to address the specific, precise, different needs uh, that exist in your community. One size fits all uh, means the rest of us are shoeless. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you, you, you've got to, 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 from my perspective, to, to really bring that home, to challenge agencies like the FCC, to challenge uh, members of Congress, especially the Commerce Committee that um, has oversight of, of, of the FCC. FCC. Um, we should be looking at ourselves better as partners. How do partners help each other? You know, they look, address the issues, and they try to get to yes. This is the problem. I keep defaulting back to where we start, where it's been a recurring refrain. There's so many people who go out of their way to try not to get the yes. That how can we do this? You know, what can we change in order for us to work, you know, smoothly as to administer, to identify issues, to recognize that, you know, California's issues are not South Carolina issues, that are not Georgia's issues. And we've got to recognize that. But there is a common denominator and refrain uh, that needs to be fine tuned in order for that to happen. So, again, I put, put it back in the, um, uh, the hands and the offices of the beholders. Uh, at every level, and to include Congress uh, from, you know, uh, from a town uh, town council uh, uh, to the White House. How we 
advance an ever-changing quest for digital equity. It is ever evolving. The standards are going to change. The, the, the need is going to change. The speeds have to change. So all of these things um, in a, a regulatory um, gumbo, need, you know, we need to address them. We, we need to harmonize them. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we need to season them uh, to the point where it's palatable uh, to all. And that all elements in terms of our regulatory dietary and needs fixed are recognized um, and are, are, are addressed, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, this quest for digital equity. So let's <laughs> let's do gumbo. Uh, I, I love that term. And you also so um, rightly pointed out, we need to get to the politics of yes. The politics of no is 10 times easier than the politics of yes. Agreed. And the conversation has to be elevated to the top levels of policymakers, the top levels of the companies, the, the chief executive officers. And um, the last time I looked, left, right wasn't the direction we were trying to go. We are trying to go forward. We need that, we need that enlightened front position. You've inspired us to lead. Rochelle has the responsibility to, to represent us legally. And I really want to uh, turn back to you, Rochelle, to uh, think about and advise not only CETF, but all of California in terms of the partnerships, what we need, how do we get to that conversation that ends up being yes? At this time, I think we do have a lot of clout because of the pandemic. And what I would suggest is we should get the firepower of the governor's office and the agency leads to really sit down and make a partnership. I think at this moment, we actually have some opportunities. One of them is 5G. The wireless carriers want faster permitting for their 5G deployments, and that's an opportunity for us. So we could strike a deal where we have some faster permitting from people like Caltrans, et cetera, and we could exchange for that a committed wireline affordable offer by all of them. And Governor Newsom did issue on August 14th, 2020, uh, an executive order broadband for all. And he has charged the state agencies that serve on the California Broadband Council to prepare and submit an action plan by the end of December. Uh, the California Emerging Technology Fund by statute is also a member of the California Broadband Council. We are looking to have that conversation at the highest levels of leadership with the internet service providers. Uh, this is an open call and invitation uh, with you too to all of the ISPs uh, that their CEOs need to have the conversation uh, to be uh, able to work out that partnership that we're talking about. Um, it's been an honor to be the vice chair of Shelby. I voluntarily got involved with them because I felt there were a lot of important federal issues that impacted schools, libraries, and healthcare, and that it, it really folded nicely into the work that we do in California, uh, including with CETF. So the good news is Shelby, as I mentioned, has been working on this contribution issue for the Universal Service Funds Program. And then secondly, there's been a flurry of bills involving broadband since the pandemic began. So we've been advocating for infrastructure bills, which would include large amounts of money for broadband. And, and in California, we are also talking about getting the anchor institutions mapped. And that's yep. something else that's very important. So I'm glad you brought up the mapping and um, who, uh, what entities are excluded because um, that, is, um, uh, that is less than optimal and we need to address that. What are the words of wisdom that you wanna leave us with? The California Emerging Technology Fund, our board of directors, our partners, uh, the people who are working so hard every day in our state to get the digitally disadvantaged uh, online. Continue your quest to fix what's broken. 
you are in your communities, you are of your communities, you know what uh, people in the community are, are asking for, you know what the needs are. Uh, continue uh, to be an advocate, continue uh, uh, to be their voice, uh, because sometimes uh, they have been so disabled for so long that they are just can't, they can't do not have the energy or the wherewithal to speak up. So continue to do that. Um, I know there are times where uh, that uh, that exercise is exhausting. Um, I know there are times where uh, you know those uh, those efforts uh, do not in the short term and even in the intermediate term uh, that they return the dividends that you think um, are, are are worthy. But every step by way of advocacy and awareness, every step helps. Uh, you know, every revelation and acknowledgement uh, to ensure that those who did not know, know now. Uh, you will never know when that uh, would be uh, applied uh, and, uh, in order to meet and address the needs in which you advocate. And I, I'll close by saying this. Um, we all say we want boundless opportunities, uh, that we want seamless partnerships, uh, that we want enhanced collaborations. That only happens um, if we continue to bridge, to connect, to be a voice for those who are digitally disadvantaged. Uh, so uh, do not get weary. Um, Take a break every now and then, but don't, you know, can't be a long break. Um, and I assure you, if there's nothing else I know, every step you take in the right direction helps. What I'd like to say is seize the day to the board, because I think we are at a very unusual moment right now, and we have more opportunities than we had before. Um, so I think now is the time that CETF should go directly to the FCC. Absolutely, the commissioners are listening to us and they wanna hear from us because they feel like we're a neutral voice. So I do think seize the day is what's going on for us for 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So seize the day and uh, keep in mind that uh, just as you have been trailblazers, as I started uh, this conversation, I want to uh, underscore that you, Rochelle Chong, and you, Mignon Clyburn, are continuing pioneers. That there is this future opportunity working together. You've been so inspiring. It has been a true honor and privilege to just be able to join you, to hear you, to be uh, inspired and reaffirmed by your advice. And um, you have done a great service for all of us in California by coming together today and uh, having this conversation.